is going up in flames. We are seething that a government of messianic lunatics, the government that went MIA during October 7th and was responsible for it, is still the one in power and only amassing even more of it. This government that does not even try to hide the fact that any unwritten contract between it and its citizens does not exist anymore, unless they too are messianic settlers. This government is, quite literally, killing its citizens. And for what? For Bibi's career? For Orit Struk's fever dreams of rebuilding Gush Katif? Last week we woke up to the horrifying news that the bodies of six hostages, Carmel Gat, Almog Savusi, Hirsch Goldberg Poland, Eden Yerushalmi, Ori Danino, and Alexander Lobanov were found dead in Gaza. According to the IDF, they were shot in the head a mere two days before they were discovered. Three of them, Carmel, Hirsch, and Eden, were supposed to be released in the first humanitarian pause of the hostage deal that has since been torpedoed again and again. They survived in unfathomable conditions for 327 days, only to be executed by Hamas when the IDF got close to their location, only to be condemned to death by Netanyahu and his constant torpedoing of deal after deal. Yes, the bullets were shot by Hamas, but the blood is on Netanyahu's hands. He left them to die. He made sure they won't come back. The phrase, there is no more military solution, that we chant here every week, never rang so painfully true as it has this past week. The prices of, that civilians in the region are paying are getting higher and higher. The longer Netanyahu and Sinwar refuse to end this war, since our last protest, at least 93 people have been killed by the IDF in Gaza and at least 29 in the West Bank, and specifically in Jenin. In the village of Beta, also in the West Bank, a Palestinian child, a mere 13-year-old, Bana Lebom, was shot in the head by the IDF, as was an American peace activist, Aznu Aizgi Ayi. And the north of Israel is still under constant bombardment. The Israeli police continue its race to the bottom as it competes its transformation to Ben Gvir's private militia. Only this week, an Israeli young woman was arrested and then disappeared for a day to an undisclosed location for allegedly throwing some sand at Ben Gvir on the beach. To this time, no arrests have been made in the break-in to Sdeteman, by the way. After another six hostages came back dead because of him, Netanyahu found another way to make sure more Gazan and hostages die by insisting that the Philadelphia Corridor is now our Wailing Wall. Our brand new holiest of holies, which we cannot give up on and is worth sacrificing human life for on a daily basis. Whoever murders hostages does not want a deal, said the man who everyone by now knows has done anything he can to kill the deal. He pretty much told the citizens of Israel that the Philadelphia corridor is worth more than the lives of their loved ones, and Israelis responded in kind. After almost a year of dogged protesting, the last night saw the biggest protest in the history of the country, with over 500,000 people out on the streets. That is over 5% of the country's population. And as we continue to look for the tiniest sliver of hope in this, we should pause on this fact and remember that studies show that once you're over 3.5% of a populace engages in nonviolent resistance, the government will be toppled. We must remember that we must watch our families get arrested without charges, beaten up for protesting, or both. We must remember this to strengthen our own resolve here. We are here today and every Sunday to amplify our peace community and families back home who have been protesting every day, who have been skunked, beaten up, arrested in their attempts to fight this government, end this war, and end the occupation. We are here to support the families of the hostages who are arrested when all they're saying is, seal the deal, seal the deal, seal the deal. Seal the deal! Seal the deal! 
We are here in solidarity with our Palestinian and Israeli siblings on the ground, fighting for a better future for everyone between the river and the sea. We are here to fulfill the requests of Carmel, Eden, and Hirsch. Now, by their wills, their last videos from the Hamas tunnels of hell showed them begging us to keep fighting for their lives. It's too late for them, but we have to keep fighting for all the other hostages who are running out of time. We are also here to amplify a poster in Hirsch's room reading, Jerusalem is everyone's, or Chaim Perry's sign reading, the occupation is killing us. We know what Hirsch and so many of the hostages returning in boxes knew, that the only safe and just future is a safe and just future for everybody. It is too late for them, but not for us. So we must persevere. And thank you for being with us in this fight here. Thank you for coming out week after week, for telling your friends and family, this is not a small thing, and you don't know how grateful we are to be here with you. So. War will never have a winner. Safety is what we deliver. War will never have a winner. Safety is what we deliver. War will never have a winner. Safety is what we deliver. War will never have a winner. Safety is what we deliver. War will never have a winner. without Noah here, so thank you for bearing with our uh, less musical air here. Um, Israel and Palestine? Our futures are intertwined! Israel and Palestine! Our futures are intertwined! Over the past 11 months, Tamar, one of the co-founders of Israelis for Peace, has been standing here and raising the voice of her friend from Gaza, whose name she has to protect for her safety, with whom she's running, been running a small direct donation program for the past seven years. This week, Tamar is not here, but her friend sent her this message. 
next month, we will have reached a full year of the bloodiest war in my life. But during the past two days, I went through a special moment, my birthday. The day I consider the most beautiful and greatest in my history, but this time, it was completely different. It was the worst birthday of my entire life. As soon as 12 a.m. arrived, I was supposed to celebrate my birthday normally like any other person, but this time I was trembling with fear from the sound of explosions, shelling, and clashes. It is a day I hope will never happen again, and all I hope to achieve are my wishes for the end of this war and the return of the kidnapped and for the two people to live in peace side by side. I received many beautiful words and wishes from the members and organizers of this protest. They do not know me, but they sent me their love, sympathy, and beautiful wishes from me on the occasion of my birthday. I believe that we must break all borders and barriers in the name of humanity and for the sake of our generations and children. Freedom, respect, and love are the basis for building any bridge of relations between all of the people of the world. Therefore, I ask you not to stop your protest until all the goals demanded since the beginning of the war are achieved. My brothers and sisters, thank you Thank you for your humanity. on October 7th and executed late in August, recently wrote. Gil Dickman was one of the family members who put everything aside during these 11 months to fight for his cousin and all of the hostages to return alive, Gil's words. Kineret, Carmel's mother, was taken from her home on October 7th, led barefoot through the paths of the kibbutz, and then murdered, shot in the head. I know because I found the video of it on Telegram. <clears throat> what could be done? Carmel <clears throat> was shot in the head 10 and a half months later. There were 327 days to save her, days when her brothers, all and alone, <clears throat> and her father, Eshin, her uncles and aunts, my sister, Shai, and I did everything we could, but it wasn't enough. We failed. <clears throat> because Netanyahu said no. Revenge on Hamas has no meaning if it does not save lives. The man who shot Kamel must be walking around the tunnels of Gaza right now. Do you think our hot heart's desire is for the, to see this murderer die? That we are willing to risk the lives of soldiers 
and hostages for his death, the thing we want, that the people of Israel want, the right and proper thing to focus on above all else, is not the death of the one who murdered Carmel, but the lives of the hostages who can still be saved. The life of Tal, of Romi, of Keith, of Ohad, of Liri and Daniela, and Avra, and Hisham. This used to be the difference between us and terror organizations. We cared who lived, they cared who died. Today the borders between us have blurred. Sinwa won. Benjamin Netanyahu surrendered to him and was ready to murder the soul of the country in order to stay in power. And these two psychopaths will continue to sacrifice the lives of their citizens to maintain their own power. He has lost his fucking mind. He has lost his fucking mind. Netanyahu must resign. He has lost his fucking mind. Space really helped me develop the clarity I needed. Can you hear me now? Is that better? Okay. Um, this space really helped me develop the clarity I needed in order to go there, so thank you all. Um, what I'm about to tell you comes mostly from the work with over a month with uh, Jordan Valley activists, as well as observation uh, I took from a tour in Hebron called, uh, with an organization called Breaking the Silence. Um, Jordan Valley activists offer uh, a network of Jewish or international volunteers that go to the West Bank and try to create a semblance of accountability for settler violence. And Breaking the Silence are ex-soldiers attesting for human rights violations by the army. Please consider donating if you're there, if you're here, or volunteering if you ever go there. For the stories I'm about to tell you, I'll be replacing people's names uh, for confidentiality. Um, but however, before I start, let's please have a moment of silence for 26-year-old American Turkish citizen Aysenor Ezgi Aygi, as well as 13-year-old Bana Laboum, as well as a dozen more lives lost in the West Bank just in the last few weeks. Amir, a child I met in the Jordan Valley, was five, is five years old. He's strong and very proud of that fact. He could carry my heavy backpack for me all by himself and maybe even believe me when I pretended to lose an arm wrestling. A few days before I left, Amir was playing with his toy truck. He said it was Gil the Settler, 
as he moved it back and forth on the bench. A few hours later, Gil and an 18 year old settler from a nearby outpost, or Mahaz, <laughs> did show up on his mini tractor or tractoron. His harassment of families has been so regular that, in an extremely rare instance of the police actually doing something, I've been told he's been issued a restraining order. So he parked his tractor own in a hill overlooking their property, just a few steps away. He leaned next to an Israeli flag that most likely him or one of his friends planted, because like animals, they like to mark their territory. He stood there and just watched the family, arranging stones and walking around the hill. We filmed him and got ready to call the police. As we were doing that, another kid, nine-year-old Zahir, walked past me, chest puffed up, ready to take him on. Although I secretly admired him for that, I had to use my stern teacher voice and chase after him to tell him to go back to his family. I've been told Jill had punched him in the stomach in the past. And last night when the settlers came, they showed no hesitation, putting their faces right in front of the women and children as they were sleeping. Jill eventually left, but as we know, he would come back in a few days. This is one of many interactions I've had with settlers this month. The worst kind, ones that come from outposts that are only illegal in theory. I've had a stone thrown at me. I've seen a 16-year-old kid try to drive his truck to own through a herd of sheep in an attempt to make them abort their babies and injure themselves and more. Sinwar said this moment is worth it, and the far right Settlement and National Project Minister Orit Struk agrees with him, calling this time a miracle period for settlement expansion. In observing these piranhas, it's easy to see why they feel this way. According to B'Tselem, 19 Palestinian communities, 19, numbering at 1,123 people have been displaced in Area C since October 7th. Many settlements and outposts have been built as well. Kahanis have been waiting for this moment. Many of you know about the rape and torture that happened in Sdeteiman, and I've learned that many of those guards came from uh, a settlement called Kiryat Arba, where people have a long history of putting stones on Baruch Goldstein's grave and terrorizing, terrorizing Palestinian and Hebron. For the Kahanis community, this time is an opportunity. The darker the time, the more powerful they become, and they know that. They are in our government, our military, our police, our education system, and Tel Avivians might buy produce from them without knowing. This is a reality they have been engineering for a long, long time. fucking shame, yes. In the face of structural violence, human rights advocates can document and try to help the communities hold on, but it's not enough. Gail left on that day, but he'll come back. Another example, after the trochron was driven through the herd of sheep, a sheep was injured and took an extra half an hour in the heat to arrive back at his pasture, nearly dying in the process. We helped it survive, but it's not enough. It's gonna have to go back the next day. And in a couple of days, the settlers will come again and throw stones at another sheep. These settlers, who are by the way brainwashed teenagers and young adults, won't stop. This is not sustainable and we need structural change now. We need an end to the occupation now. And obviously, that starts with a ceasefire and hostage exchange. <laughs> Every anti-occupation Israeli and Palestinian I've talked to agreed that we need help. I've met a Palestinian and Israeli community leaders with Breaking the Silence who said they could imagine a just reality in the time it took them to finish a cup of tea, and I believe them. But as has been said here before, our leaders are pyromaniacs 
As long as they are the last to burn from the fire they create, nothing will change. The international community needs to ask itself, why is it allowing the leaders who light the fire to be the last to burn? Human right violations need to be consequential to the people who commit them, not just the people who experience them. Human beings are dying and suffering en masse while political, structural, hierarchical, and ideological, ideological realities remain as firm as stone. Abraham, jo um, Abraham Joshua Heschel said, there could either be one world or no world. And what I've seen when I looked at Amir pretending at his toy truck was guilt a terrorizing settler is humanity making the wrong choice. Um, again, both Jordan Valley activists and looking at the occupation in the eye really needs volunteers and support. So if you know people in the area, please consider telling them about this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ari, for sharing your recent experience with us. I, hey, hey, ho, ho. Yeah. I mean, there's only one appropriate chant after that. Hey, hey, hey ho, ho, ho. The occupation has got to go. Hey, hey. about Komel Gat, his dear friend. something uh, to read about Carmel Gat who uh, I, I have to, okay uh, Carmel Gat and, and me we we have been friends for uh, for the past 22 years um, and I was always honored by that fact and now I feel it's uh, well I, I don't exactly know what to feel yet but I did write something about Carmel um, and I hope I could uh, read the whole thing. <clears throat> I don't want to think about Carmel in the past tense. I don't want to remember her or talk about someone who is gone. I want Carmel to come back. That's the honest truth. After all this time, I've imagined how Carmel arrives in JFK for a long vacation in New York to take some time away from Israel after her release. I spent so long imagining in these past months how I would wait for her at the entrance to Terminal 5 or 7 if she chooses to fly low cost. I tried to convince her otherwise. Low cost always turns out to be the most expensive option. But she would say, but I'm only carrying a backpack. If you spare pieces of clothes, 
clothes and, and a toothbrush, and that's the way she traveled. And so I'd be waiting. We would walk around the city and talk, or maybe just say nothing at all. We would, I would only tell her how happy I am that she is alive and back here with us. But she's not coming back, and she will never arrive at Terminal 5 or 7. Carmel was a positive person. Don't have grief for what is lost. Celebrate the love you share instead. That's what she would say. I know. But actually, I do regret not making an extra effort to get a ticket to the House of Yes that night when she was here on a visit. She went out dancing and invited me to join. I admitted to Brooklyn, but there were no tickets, and the next slot was 30 minutes later. I regret not making that phone call or texting when she came back from Israel from India at the end of September, just one year ago. You should visit her Instagram account and see how beautiful her trip was, how happy she seems in it. I knew she should be back, but I was busy and couldn't find a time. I knew she wouldn't mind. And when we talked, it would be as if no time has passed. I was and still am curious about her six month stay there in India. I wish we could have that last conversation face to face to hear about our new, our new exciting experience and what our future holds. It was for all I know a trip that would change her life forever. I wish I could tell you more about Carmel, about her smile, her radiant smile. I'd like to tell you how smart she was, about her observations that were as deep as they were true. But what I really want is for her to come back. I don't want to miss her. I don't want to grieve. I don't want, to, I don't want any of this crippling sad, sadness. I just want for her to come back. Thank you, Yonatan.
solution. There is no military solution. There is okay, well, you know, it's every week we really thank you for coming out. And as we've been doing over the past month or so, we have everyone gather in a formation. Do you want them just? Yeah. So if everyone could just scooch together, taller people behind the banner, um, people who want to sit on the ground a little forward, we're going to get a group photo and we're also going to do some group chants. So thank you. Could you shift the banner this way over? Like everyone kind of like That's beautiful, actually.